Thank you very much. You know, in selecting a topic and the dismal science, I probably didn't have your entertainment needs in mind. So I appreciate the courage that you've had to come here today to uh, view my guest lecture. I um, hope to be informative, and that on that uh, note, perhaps you'll find favor with my lecture. I also hope to be uh, entertaining and animated about what I have to speak, and I hope on that also note that you'll find some favor with my lecture. Um, by way of introducing my lecture, I address uh, both uh, my acknowledgments and your expectations. I thank Jackson Faber for his generous and risky offer to have me kick off the CAP guest lecture series for the academic year. I pray that I will rise to the high standards of this tradition in CAP. However, in several other traditions of the college I break. My tenure here is in its infancy, and I'm still hopeful that I will not become crankier, indeed cantankerous, than when I arrived eight weeks ago. But I have an incorrigibly anomic personality, and I question everything. I pray that falls within your academic tradition as well, for this will be a contrarian's lecture. For Marv Rosamond in the back, this is a Moshe Kapera. Don't ask me to explain that. That would be a whole course. The appearance of my presentation, or rather the lack of an expected appearance, is a mild protest to the central use of visual media in the college. This for several reasons. One, I am of the old school and need to see your faces. In a darkened room, I may not detect facial expressions and other body language that says, I am disconcerted, I am asleep, I am gone. With Q&A relegated to the final 10 minutes of my presentation, I need greater intimacy and constancy in our communication. Indeed, my lecture is only 35 minutes, as I am insistent that our exchange will ensue. Two, the deployment of images is anathema to your imagination. After all, they would be my images, not yours. They do advance descriptive or cognitive learning and indeed replace a thousand words. But the unique role of the academy is in its abstractions of reality in order to understand that real world Indeed, see it much better. In the absence of mind-altering drugs, the use of pictures does not advance that special role. The college's evolutionary course is in opposition to this academic theme. We are enamored with technology and want to use it. The almost IMAX screen that looms in my background will deliver in fact, it's delivering as I speak that evolutionary uh, course this semester to the point where the instructor will be on the screen as I'm on the screen in the Indianapolis Center, and thereon using yet another visual media prop to present knowledge. As a testament to the use of visual media in the college, the lack of it in this presentation, I predict will be more controversial than what I have to say. My pedagogic style is to interact the abstract, at times obscure and obtuse, concepts with the relevant, to wreak havoc in a world of order, to disturb your train of thought, to change an assumption in order to explore a much different outcome. Accordingly, I bring you radio, a much hotter medium in a Marshall McLuhan sense than TV. It requires your interaction. It requires your imagination. All this caters to your exercise of critical judgment and your capability to evaluate information. I trust you recognize that these exercises and not the accumulation of knowledge are the point of your education. Conceding to the visual, I present a single prop. This is a 28 millimeter lens from a 35-year-old 
fully manual SLR camera that I have at home. On it is clearly marked, although I'm sure you can't see it from the back of the room, but you're familiar with these types of lenses, uh, depth of field. And when I use it, I pause to think. Thinking more than looking makes me see the objects of our world. In a camera, there is an aperture, and its diameter determines focus. The greater the dilation, the greater the focal length the more perspective. As we look at layers in front and behind, that which we're used to seeing at minimum focus. Today, I will aim to refocus your perspective on the bottom line. As a ruler of what we can and cannot do, and demonstrate its central relevance to our professional lives. Through this prop, we shall challenge the most revered and accepted paradigms of microeconomics, that of the theory of the firm. I find little in my education as an economist to mount such a challenge. Yet it is my planning education, its focus on forethought, the comprehensive, differentiated impacts, and synthetic thought that leads me to reformulate this theory. On this same point, and secondly, as to your expectations, my topic, the theory of the firm, obviously is an economist paradigm. It is not thematic of this college or of other CAP guest lecturers you have heard or, I presume, will hear this academic year. That it is alien to us is the point of my lecture. Thirdly, and more personally, I have taught the value of turning a profit to students and applied this value as a land developer. I am proud of my heat-seeking, computerized development performer that iteratively revises scenarios until the bottom line is realized. This lecture mocks what I do. In rendering the bottom line an uncomfortable companion, I benefit from healthy self-critique and perspective. I am a contrarian first, a dogmatist second. Lastly, before we start, the extracurricular format of the guest lecture permits me some license to choose the provocative over the accurate. I have an hour and I am relaxed to fill it with equivocation, responsible as that may be to an academic, would diminish the histrionics I intend for my speech. After all, this is theater, not the classroom. What is the nature of the beast we commonly term the bottom line? <clears throat> I do not question the relevance of the bottom line to our built environment and our professional lives, only the reverence by which it is treated. The bottom line, that ruler of what we build, it defines efficiency, that of space, that of investment. In the public sector, it is the rule of fiscal conservatism, where budgets maintain their balance each and every period. In the private sector, it is the judgment that removes artistic forms, indeed what we may call architecture, from buildings to an entrepreneur, it requires external factors called regulations and subsidies to provide affordable housing and other development that is in the public interest. It is more than an economic principle. It is revered as a religion. It negates or supersedes all other principles. It makes acceptable stealing as we are reminded of the collapse of such institutions as Enron and WorldCom. Executive theft only became objectionable when the bottom line was no longer apparent. Can anyone name any firm in the news and being investigated by the SEC and Justice Department that made a ton of money for their shareholders while committing the same malfeasance and criminal behavior 
of those in the news and losing a ton of money to their investors. Turn a profit, distribute it to shareholders, and how you accomplish this becomes irrelevant. To for, fail to address the bottom line and your methods are identified as criminal. The difference between a weekend trip to your yacht and a weekend trip and an everyday trip to your jail cell is precisely the bottom line. Under the economic theory of the firm, each firm selects product and production levels in maximizing profits. The firm's decision focuses on a line, more precisely, a number. The dimension is singular. If in an operating statement, then that number reflects a profit or loss and is expressed as NCF or negative uh, net cash flow. For a development enterprise, the point of break-even cash flow must be realized within the parameters set by investors. If for a global enterprise, such as Hewlett Packard or Centrex as a land developer, then strategic planning and marketing pursue market share. Despite the word planning in strategic planning, market share is a more impressive bottom line while clearly falling outside an urban planner's interests. If a development pro forma, then the expression is constituted by the equality of sources and applications of funds. If an investment prospectus, then ROI, or return on investment, or IRR, or internal rate of return, becomes the religion of REITs or real estate investment trust. If an application for debt financing, then several measures of mortgage, mortgage feasibility are employed, including adequacy of mortgage coverage and ratios of loan to both value created and the cost of their creation. Security, whether mortgage backed or that attendant to the bar borrower receives a rating and falling below that line results in denied applications. Indeed, as a land developer, I viewed the demand for the development as proximately established by those willing and able to finance it. Simply, banks demand buildings. Each decision that I have just mentioned focuses on an applicable bottom line. Each decision determines and becomes our built environment. The, uh, thus, Architectures, unending inquiry as to whether form follows function or art is irrelevant in the context of the bottom line. Simply, architecture follows profit. Profit determines the use, size, shape, and even style of buildings. By this, I exclude as not significant in numbers what I call trophy architecture, supported as patronage to the arts and where the bottom line is indeed irrelevant. Despite this incontrovertible and central truth, now one course in the college is devoted to it. Why? I suggest that when the college establishes the priority of interdisciplinary synergy, it is addressing only the disciplines of the college and not of the university. This approach ignores the imperatives, imperatives of politics and economics to the built environment. This approach also does not avail us of university. How relevant is the bottom line to the interest of land-based professionals? Public, excuse me, private industry development is driven by the bottom line, so what are its common results? One. Clearly evident is the dominance of cookie-cutter houses of production home building and of track subdivisions in land development. The dominance of these features shuns both creative design and diverse consumer choices. The conventional strategic marketing of this industry, as epitomized in large part by the American dream, promotes risk mitigation and these centrist products. 
Whereas housing consumers demand neighborhood as the preeminent factor of their choice, the mainstream of home builders does not create neighborhoods. Thus, we have an undersupply of recreational, cultural, and civic facilities, or what we term public spaces. Indeed, survey research conducted by the Wharton School into traditional neighborhood developments reveals they are poor investment decisions. In the conventional sense, TNDs attract rather than avoid negative cash flow. They entail front-end loaded costs while carrying a protracted period for their recapture. As a rule, until the TND developer arrives at the sale of the final phase of the development, does it pocket any cash. When I addressed a few years ago the National Association of Home Builders, the NAHB, on the value of design in subdivision development, I differentiated between design that creates value and the absence of design that creates profits. Apparently, developers are interested in TNDs. They just don't build them because they don't have to. They are making money already. And based on their own proven product, they build that product with a lower risk. I could teach them a lot about how to create value. Home builders would be my teachers on how to turn a profit. Simply, track subdivisions are viewed by them as a competitive necessity. Two, cookie cutter commercial buildings, if you will, production commercial developments. Remove the architect from architecture. The principle here is one design, many applications and exclusively to serve the interest of the bottom line at the expense of the architect, carried to its logical evolution. The approach to architecture as represented by big box retailers and chain restaurants spells the demise of the architect. If you are homesick, I suggest you become a patron of the Olive Garden with exacting replication throughout the nation. All this is to avoid the use of the architect to reinvent an already successful wheel. I have witnessed the demise of other professions, such as appraisers, as casualties of the bottom line of commercial and residential lenders and REITs. Replacing a detailed and professional study of real estate value is the CMA, or Comparable Market Analysis. Acquire a database of realty transactions and apply MS access for a statistical measure of central tendency and the value determination can be yours without the cost of professional services. Three, the conventional theory of building efficiency minimizes wasted spaces which are defined as non-revenue generating portions of the building. Design professionals in the audience, if you want to know why public spaces get removed from development decisions, it is because of the bottom line. Thus, witness the disposition of atriums, works of art, plazas that extend beyond the minimum setback, and supportive but deemed extravagant uses in commercial buildings, such as employer-provided daycare and residential health care. Four, economies external to the production decision are not internalized by the firm, to wit. One, despite the McCargian call to design with nature, environmental protection is viewed as an obstacle to development, not as an objective. Two. Traffic is addressed through fiscal expenditures, such as bypass highways and occasionally subsidies for mass transit. Design that reduces the dependence on the car remains peripheral to mainstream development. Three, 
The free market produces an undersupply of affordable housing and an undersupply of quality and higher education for lower income groups. These are not represented as failures of the free market system, although they are. In the seminal 1776 tre treatise, uh, The Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, central tenet that a free market allocates goods and services efficiently, efficiently carried a caveat the presumption of an appropriate distribution of income. Only a few states, led by New Jersey, require developer-subsidized affordable housing. The economic internalization is financed here by a set of affirmative measures of the host local government, including density bonuses, infrastructure design waivers, priority and sewer connections, the elimination of exactions, and the acceleration of development approvals. In the vast majority of states, the public directly pays for affordable housing, making decision external to private home building. In sum, good design, sustainable development, social equity, and other values of the college have no value in the mainstream of real-world decisions of how we conduct the enterprises of the built environment. These values of the college are external to those decisions. If they were internal, then why do we need to take field trips to far-off places in order to experience them? Why are they rare? found, as I call, trophy architecture? And why do they require extraordinary leadership? Conversely, if good design or affordable housing were profitable, they would be an adequate supply and be part of the mainstream of our economy and culture. Yet, with too few exceptions, such as building futures, the college leaves unattended this set of relationship. By CAPS default, MBAs attend to the mainstream of our built environment. They are educated to cogently advance land development as we have come to know it. To our chagrin, it is their language that is spoken and their arguments that prevail. Why is economics not more like planning? That is, why don't economists share my view? Well, they never took a course in urban impact analysis. Planners study the impact of private development on both the private and public economies of a geographic area. They do so to influence the character of such development and in order to affect the maximum net benefit fiscally, socially, environmentally, and economically. In contrast, economists trace private production decisions, public monetary and fiscal policies, and demand determinants largely to predict or explain a future economy. But in a free market, there is no comprehensive plan of how we want the firm to behave. Indeed, that would border on socialism, making plan a four-letter word. To economists, the built environment is either a consumer good, as in housing, or a factor of production, as in industrial and commercial applications, or an amenity provided by the other guys, the public sector. Two, players in the economy are expected to have short-term goals, in contrast to the visionary mission of planners. That is, publicly elected officials have terms, publicly held companies have quarterly reports. The socioeconomic theory of organizational behavior focuses on short-term investment. Put together a string of underperforming quarters as CEO of a corporation or managing general partner of a real estate investment group and call your headhunter. 
win the Gulf War and yet ignore the economy for several quarters and you retire as president to Kennebunkport. Chairs become deans and in turn provosts based on measurable performances over the short run called academic years. There would be a string of academic years that are successful, but performance is measured in annual increments. The fortunes of managers advance or fall based on these expectations. Managers make the decisions of the firm. Three, economic product is segregated within a multi-product enterprise in order to weed out winners and losers. If a developer of a master plan community knows that particular uses, say daycare or theater, are not the highest and best uses, meaning they fall short of profit maximization, the developer replaces those uses with others that do yield a higher financial return. Despite its master planning with strong implications for integration of uses in design, uses are still segregated on the balance sheet. Thus, the theory of the firm focuses on profit, its maximization over the short term, and as segregated by identifiable products. Alluding to our metaphorical camera lens, the focal length of economics is short relative to planning. Planners compose a picture and see more things. We see a dimension that is temporal and another that is cross-sectional. That is, my discipline sees what is in the foreground and background of the focus of attention and strives at their integration. As a planner, let me outline my revision of the theory of the firm. Let us start. The theory of the firm is a ruse. The bottom line is neither. The history of enterprises that lose money is that they are the most worthwhile and creating enduring, indeed, breakthrough value. Further, it is not a line. Profit and loss is a field of considerable depth. It is a series of our focus along a temporal and cross-functional uh, continuum. By extending our focal length and how we view the world, the world of profit, of loss, of value, we meet the requisites of this revised theory of the firm. This revision suggests that the economics of the built environment, indeed of all productive enterprises, is multidimensional. When Einstein sat at the train in Princeton Junction, observing the relative motion of a train on the adjoining track, he exposed a theory of relativity of motion. Each train moved about 500 miles per hour relative to the axis of the Earth. And the set of trains had differential motion relative to each other. Is value relative to our references? Is it realized only over adequate time to measure it? Is it realized not on the object of our camera's focus, but on the objects within a depth of our camera's field? It's, is value, even profit, indirectly realized? President Brownell has asked me uh, to lunch. When we break bread, I will be asking him to embark on an enterprise that will lose money, yet is worthwhile and deserving of the university's investment. My expectation then is that he will ask me to pay for lunch and he will seek an exit. I am hopeful, nevertheless, that he will surprise me. Eight years ago, real estate executives of the University of Pennsylvania were prepared to lose money in the development of retail, office, and housing in order to gain a better neighborhood for the university and attract both faculty and students. Under the West Philadelphia Initiative, they did make this trade. Here the benefit includes Penn's ranking over the past eight years from 11th to 4th in New SU's and World Reports ratings, 
and a meteoric rise in Penn's endowment. Such logic requires courage. Such logic is the basis for a new economic paradigm. The West Philadelphia Initiative is a set of five programs. One, a safe and clean neighborhood with paid workers. Two, a housing program incorporating 105% mortgage guarantees for faculty home ownership and landlords of student apartments. Three, the development of retail, including university anchors of the Inid Pen and the university bookstore. Four, a charter school in the neighborhood is sponsored by the School of Education. Five, business development in the form of university incubator services. It enjoys the active support of President Judith Roden. It incorporates as a strategic objective the role of the neighborhood in attracting and supporting superior students and faculty. The in lost money over a period of its development that would have turned most investors away. All five programs have subpar direct financial returns. But this initiative embraces the new theory of the firm. Value, possibly through large, well-endowed institutions, is created over time and manifests in key institutional areas far removed from that which is initiated by the development. In economics, this is a spillover effect. Thus, each, rather all, in combination of the five programs impacts significantly on the desirability of Penn to students and faculty and in turn creates better student and faculty bodies. That enhanced quality to education not only eventually is expressed at the bottom line, the expression becomes much more enduring. Developers with breakthrough products found the bottom line elusive. This includes projects foreclosed upon. We hear of the founding contribution of Andre Duany and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg uh, to TND. Yet the vision of the Kentlands <coughs> was that of its original owner, Joseph Alfandre. Alfandre purchased the Kent farm of 352 acres in 1987 for $43 million, committing a cardinal sin. He did a takedown of a non-revenue producing realty prior to development approvals. The interest on the mortgage from Chevy Chase Bank was $16,000 per diem. At that time, Indianapolis-based mall developer Mel Simon purchased an option from Alfandre for the right to buy 70 acres for $17 million. An economic turndown ensued in shopping malls, causing Simon to forfeit on his deal. Unable to shoulder the mortgage payments, and because of a protracted approval process for TND, a friendly foreclosure ensued in 1991. Alfandre was retained to complete the approvals Chevy Chase received a much higher return on its real estate owned or REO than it would have had from its loan. Alfandre, unable to find the bottom line during his four years of ownership, nevertheless created value in real estate, advanced perhaps more than Robert Davis did at Seaside, a breakthrough mainstream urban design and realized substantial profits for its investors. What can we borrow from accepted or emerging economic theories to advance our new theory? Well, this is ob obscure, but let me say this. There is an economic, rather a, a business theory that does address such sp spillover. It's called the theory of advertising. Advertising is a consumer good that receives no revenue from consumers. It is a production function that is neither labor nor capital. In short, it does not produce supply and cannot be sold to consumers. Yet, 
the definitive cross-industry survey of uh, William Comanner and Thomas Wilson in 1974 associated client expenditures on advertising with its revenues and profits. Advertising value is indirect through the management of demand, creating value for the product and is rewarded by creating such value for its clients. Also, the emerging field of environmental economics searches for economic value to saving the environment and economic costs to its damage. It measures the effect of an environmental regulation <clears throat> as both shifts in economic general equilibrium or the reallocation of resources and inequity or distributive impacts on classes of the population. Internalizing such value into the decision of the firm moves us closer to my revised theory of the firm. It seems that consortia efforts, collective actions, and those of large institutions, such as universities, are suited to the new theory of the firm. The larger the organization of the firm, the more capable of absorbing enterprises that lose money while creating value where value is created external to the firm, compensatory public policies will work at the margins to internalize them. These are in the form of regulatory and fiscal policies that either require all firms in an industry to internalize or that reward them adequately for doing so. At best, I would recommend these, pol uh, these policies should do both. In conclusion, Economists, captains of industry, and conservative politics have convinced our society that the decision of the firm is efficient for the economy and that the marketplace assembles these decisions, resulting in the best allocation of our resources. We ought to resist this doctrine. Planning has taught me how. We gain, through design, public spaces and with it a sense of neighborhood and social intercourse. We gain private spaces that respond to our other needs for privacy and identity. We also gain increased productivity, whether good design is applied to either the residential or work environment. Good design has value. So does responsible environmental management. So do the renewal of an impacted economy and a, a rural town the provision of affordable housing, the removal of blight, and the preservation of historic structures. These are all values of the college. Their impact on the bottom line is indirect and obscured by our focus on the bottom line. But when the camera lens of our world dilates, we increase the depth of our field of vision. We explore the dimensions of time and of cross-section of other activities also within our field of view. It is here that good planning and good architecture become good economics. Finally, those in other fields make contributions in a particular discipline. Many times these are not allied fields, and a few of these contributions are seminal. As a planner, I'm reaching out to economists to see through my lens and recognize that my contribution to economics is in its infancy. <clears throat> More so, economists have taught me how to be a better planner and teacher of planning. As a planner, I am also reaching out to my colleagues and student scholars in this college. In CAP, the built environment and inventing its visual representation binds and allies us. Given this basis of an academic fraternity, the college's three disciplines are expected to interact and we carefully protect our unique, unique approach to education by insulating ourselves. For a BUPD, a Bachelor of Urban Planning and Development, Urban planning requires 81% of that student's education here. For the MURP, the master's degree, 88% is devoted to required courses in planning. I find this alarming. 
within my own commitment to the liberal arts for the undergraduate <coughs> and planning as a multidisciplinary field at the graduate level. We of the college have important lessons to be gained from at least 16 other university disciplines of direct relevance to us and we to them. As I end, I ask, what is the harm and what is to be gained in behaving less as a college and more as a university? I'm sure I exceeded 35 minutes for that, but when I stood in the mirror this morning and I had a 12-pound poodle as my only audience, and she had good body language, by the way. She didn't object to anything that I said. It came to owing that, but I dare say that it's taken me a few minutes more. <laughs>